It's probably the fourth or fifth time I've watched that now. I showed it at a conference the other day. They're really good. The, um, the old geezer towards the end there, Pastor Bruce. He was my first pastor when I got saved. And I remember him specifically praying for me. And um, you know, every time I see Bruce, um, I'm just so encouraged. But I want to talk today about generations. Pastor Rooker, you were talking about clarity. My glasses are about three years old, and I think I need to get some more clarity. <laughs> Hallelujah. There were several significant people in that video. Uh, Sheridan and Jan, they pastor the Activate Church and lead the Activate Movement within Acts. Pastor Sam, of course, leads Equippers within Acts and leads the Acts Movement. But there were some powerful words spoken, and I want to pick up on four of them this morning. And I think for us, I was talking to Pastor Willem about it during the week, but I really believe this morning to be the prophetic. Um, Saskia and I were, were part of the team that was praying for a lot of leaders and uh, teams within our movement during the week. Sorry, not praying, prophesying. So we sort of come out of that environment and it, it, it gets a bit contagious. You suddenly sense the anointing of God and you just have to run with it. Um, so there's four key words and I haven't put a slide up or anything, but one is declaring. And there's a scripture to go that Psalm 145 verse 4 says, Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I think Josh said it there on the video. Uh, Lamentations 5.19 says, But Lord, you remain the same forever. Your throne continues from generation to generation. Psalm 118, verse 17. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell or proclaim or declare from the rooftops what the Lord has done. And my favourite, and Pastor Bruce touched on this, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ, Jesus, when I preached the good news to you. NIV says, even though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, you only have one father. And fatherhood is so important in declaring. So the first word is declaring. The second word is empowering. And we heard a lot this week about empowering the next generation. In fact, there's a movement for the last 30 years I've heard about empowering the next generation. And what empowering does is this. It's cheerleading. Go, Ollie! Go! Go, Cynthia! Go, Nathan! Go! Come on! I know you've got a little on, but go! Keep going! Keep going! Don't quit! Go, Javan, go! Go home, no, go! <laughs> go, Eva, keep going. Go, Jasmine, keep going, don't quit. I know you're tired. I know you're tired. Go, Reese. don't quit. Luke, keep going. This year, Scripture says this too will pass. This year will be gone. That's what empowering is, it's cheerleading. Another word that came through was instructing. And you, you saw Sheridan and Jan follow Jan's parents down to Christchurch. And then the two young guys, big burly guys, Luke and Jay, they were leaving the worship on Wednesday as they lead the creative team in Hamilton. And you just saw three generations of believers. Now they've just got married. So there'll be a fourth generation of believers. And that's, that's what instructing in is. And if you, if you heard there, they said, I saw it displayed. I saw it. Do you know, 
Home is the place of first instruction, not church. Often, as parents, we don't have a great home life and we think if we can get our kids to church, they'll learn what it is to be a Christian. No, it starts at home. A friend of mine used to say, your children may not always listen to you, but they will copy you. So what that says to me is my internal values, my love and passion for God, my love and passion for the church is recognized and noticed all the time by my own kids. I'll touch on that a little bit later. So declaring, empowering, instructing, and the last word is releasing. And releasing is simply this, it means putting yourself in a good position to follow the call of God. How many are sitting in here this morning and you sense the call of God on your life? Just, it's all right if you don't, so I pray that you do. <laughs> you sense the call of God. I talked to Ollie when she came in this morning about the call of God. I talked to your dad about the call of God. And Gordy, I hope I can say this, Gordy. Gordy said they're rat bags. No, he didn't. He said, as he, as, he, as he stays in church and as his kids stay in church, he sees a stronger call of God upon their lives. And that's it. That's it. That's really the secret. We want generations. We have to declare... We have to, I don't care if people say, oh, you just, oh, you people are old. I never used to be old in my brain. I'm 25. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm, 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 I'm smoking it. Actually, at 25, I still was smoking too. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't saved at 25 initially. My body says otherwise. I just put it down to the flesh and the devil. <laughs> But some other significant things were said in there. Jordan said, representing Jesus wherever we go. Someone else spoke about a legacy of faith, Pastor Sam. Someone else talked about a richness. Someone else said it was intergenerational. And you know, here's, here's something that I've, I've discovered. This is a word God's given me during the week. Is... My generation, those born in the 60s, get threatened by the younger generation when we treat life as a competition. But I had another thought. As a dad, when, we, when our children, my children, when our children were born, I didn't try to squash them. I didn't try to push them away and say to them as they came home from school with new theories and, and revelations and understandings that they got. I never said, oh, shut up. You're just nothing. You, do, you guys know nothing. You're, you're useless. You're hopeless. We're the generation that knows everything. You know? A natural father wouldn't do that, would he? I hope not. So why sometimes do we do that in church? Ah, it's all the young people's music. Yeah, well, so what? They'll discover the Beatles as well. And the monkeys, they'll get there, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it's about not being threatened. And, and here's the deal. The Holy Spirit says an intergenerational church is not either or, it's both and. It's every generation. Pastor Trevor Wilson, when he went down to Christchurch, he was asked by a little guy so high in his 50s called Billy Pearson. Billy Pearson was a Welshman, so I won't try to do his accent. He was pastoring a church in Scotland, and he went to conference, and the first night of conference, the prophet got up and said, Billy, you go home from here and pack two suitcases. Holy Spirit has called you to pastor in New Zealand. 
Imagine being, hearing that word at a conference when your wife is still in Scotland. And he's thinking, not a chance, God. If this is you, God, you have to do something. So Billy went through the conference for the rest of the week. He went home by train. Day's journey to get home. He gets home about 6 o'clock at night. Unlocks the door and he goes in. And the house smells of beautiful food. Dinner's ready. And he, he says, Rose, are you there? And she says, it's all right, Billy. I know. He says, you know what? She said, the Holy Spirit told me on Monday night to pack two suitcases. We're going to New Zealand. Wow. Let's go. And they came here and established what is now the Axe Movement in New Zealand. Wow. Isn't that incredible? And I got to sit with that guy and I got to take the books that he was throwing out that he no longer wanted and I've still got in my library. <laughs> Nobody's getting hold of those. But just imagine, if as an older man, Pastor Billy had said no. And Proverbs 24 verses 3 to 4 says this. A house built by wisdom becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. NIV says with treasures. Another version says, in the storeroom are beautiful treasures, and some of them are of old. I was thinking about King Charles. I was thinking about the Queen, actually. And in the Queen's crown, the greatest jewel is not the one found in India in 1977, or the one in South Africa in 1960. It's the one found, it's the oldest one. There's, there's jewels in this house. And some of you just need to hear today, you are valuable, you are appreciated, you've got wisdom beyond your years, and you're needed in the house. And the greatest lie of the enemy is you're past it. You mean past it? No, you're past it. Too many pastors think they're past it. And too many of us who aren't pastors think they're past it. But you're not past it. Because the enemy is on assignment. The enemy does not want church to flourish. He does not want men or women of God to flourish. He does not want the prophetic to flourish. He doesn't want worship to flourish. He has an assignment. And if he can put you off, even a degree, it'll work for him. When they went to the moon, if they, if they had moved half a degree, they would have missed the moon and just gone on to outer space. There's, in Genesis chapter 11, there's a story of a man called Terah, T-E-R-A-H, not double R-O-R. -R. And Terah was called by God. And God said to Terah, he was living in Ur of the Chaldees, which is sort of Babylonia, Iraq, Iran, that area. And God said, I want you to take yourself and your family and go to Canaan, modern day Israel. So Terah grabbed his supplies, his camels, his goats, everything else, and he uplifted and he went to the end of the known world called Haran. H A R A N. It's the end of Genesis 11. And it says, when he got to Haran, where was he called to? He was called to Canaan. And he only got to Haran. And it says, and he settled there. And I believe God is saying to many of us, God has called us to Canaan and we have settled in Haran. Now that's not a blame thing. It's just an observation, myself included. And what happened in Haran was because this part of the world, they used to worship the sun, S-U-N. And they used to worship the moon, especially the moon goddess. And so he, he came out of his familiar, familiarity and he came to the end and anything past this point was unknown. Because if he went past this point, he would have to worship the sun, S-O-N. 
So he stayed in the moon dust, in the moon nights, and continued to worship the moon gods. And then he died. And I wonder what it would be like for Terah when he stands before God Almighty. Thank you, Lord, that you called me. Yeah, but you didn't, you didn't do what I called you to do. The theme of conference this week was, where will you be in 20 years' time? And, and, and what constitutes success? And what constitutes success we came down to throughout the conference was faithfulness and obedience. They're the only two things that constitute success. 13 years ago, this week, Saskia and I were in Levin. We came to conference, and at conference we were asked if we would come to Kokoi. And we said, yeah. Now we didn't get to Taupo and settle. We came to Pukeko. You see, it was Terah who was called to go to Canaan, and when he died, God then spoke to his son Abraham and said, I want you to go to Canaan. So he goes to Canaan. And you see the difference. Terah was a generation that stopped. Abraham had Isaac, had Jacob, had the 12 boys who are the fathers of the tribes of Israel. You go to Israel today and you will find people who can claim their genealogy back. It was because of him, 12, 14 generations from Abraham to King David and then 14 generations from King David to Jesus. And just imagine if Abraham had said no. He would have died there like his father Terah. So Abraham had something in him. And uh, Roku mentioned this in the prayer meeting this morning. It's what we carry inside of us. Leviticus chapter 6. Moses spoke to the priests, word from God, and said, the fire on the altar must never go out. Even as you go from place to place, even when you take down the, the tents and everything and you move on, keep the fire going. And there's a principle in Christianity, we must keep the fire going. When we came to Pukekohe 13 years ago, we got here, and then things changed. And I have to admit, there's times I thought, were we actually, did we, we, are we, did we get this wrong? But you know what? We didn't get it wrong. We were obedient, and we were faithful. Yeah, situations changed, but I will still be faithful this week and next week. We've got to keep the fire. The fire must never go out. Let, let me get just... I don't want to do a biology lesson, but it's an interesting thing. My niece, who leads Salvation Army in Rotorua, she said this to me not so long ago. She said, Uncle Mickey, you may not call me that. <laughs> Uncle Mickey, do you realise when Mum was born, my sister, I was already in her, and I was going, I was never good at biology. I said, really? How does that work? She says, when, when a baby girl is born, all the eggs that she will ever have in her life are in her as a baby. And I got a download from heaven on that. I got a download from heaven. I was thinking the same about Mary. You know, it just needed the Holy Spirit to turn that into something anointed and fantastic. So we actually carry something in us for the next generation. We actually carry something in us for the next generation. So my Christianity should not be about me. It should be about what I carry for the next generation. And the next generation. And the next generation. I was talking to uh, one pastor from New Plymouth. And they've got a man in their church who pastored the church in the 1960s. He's 94 years old. He's the greeter on the door. Good morning. How are you young people going? 
How's school? How can I pray for you? Where's it? Do you need help with kids? Check 94. You know, by the time he was able to walk out to kids' church, it's probably been PM service. <laughs> Just saying. And, and this week, you know, we've had our Acts conference, which is a ministries conference. And I need, I need to say this for clarity. I was hoping Pastor Willie would be here, but it's okay. He's given me permission. The, the call that Pastor Willem and Ruku have on their life was not found in the bottom of a Weetbix packet or on the back of a Monopoly card from McDonald's. Secondly, it's us. It's, it's something that is outworked in the local church and recognized by leaders. So the cost of going into ministry is a huge cost. It's a massive cost. It's not, you've got a little PS before your name, but it's a calling. And I said to Pastor Willem, um, on Wednesday night can anybody remember the vision he shared at the beginning of the year for a building the building this is prophetic for us the building is key for our church the building is key for our church the building is not the foundation of our church. Let me clarify that. The foundation is Jesus. But what do I mean by the building is the key? Well, what happens with a key is you unlock. And our community will be unlocked in the area, layer of financial guidance and assistance. Stella of investing in people and businesses in counselling, in feeding the hungry. We can't do that out of here. We can't do that by hiring little spots around town. It's just too difficult. But when you have your own home, you can do so much with it. You can knock out an internal wall. You can, you can extend an area. You can laminate the floors. Jody. So it's not the foundation, it's the building. And, and God gave me a picture of what that building would look like. And, and I might have shared this. The Lower Hutt Church just bought a building in Narrow Gorge, which is closer to Wellington, called The Rock. I was part of the Lower Hutt Church from 1986 till 96. And in that time, we, we had a building which was smaller than this stage. And it used to be packed. There'd be people out on the street. And we prayed and we gave and we invested and we looked for buildings all over the place. Finally, we found one in the middle of Lower Hutt. But today, they've got a purpose-built building with daycares and halls and gymnasiums and and commercial kitchens and and what are they doing they have exploded in numbers and they have exploded in ministries starting up around the place that's what a building does in john chapter 3 jesus spoke to nicodemus and he spoke to him in the religious language because nicodemus was a religious man in john chapter 4 jesus spoke to the woman at the well the samaritan woman and he used a very compassionate language. He didn't use the same language that he spoke to Nicodemus. You with me? He spoke a loving, caring language because that woman had had five husbands and plenty of men in between. And any time a man spoke to her, it was normally not with good intentions. And yet Jesus spoke to her and unlocked her. And with Nicodemus, he needed to hear a word in religious cloakage and it unlocked him. So that's that's what that's what I see with the building for us is that we can move and minister and have a home. Who would like not to have to set up every Sunday morning and back down every Sunday night? 
hallelujah, nearly finished and come to. In Mark chapter 2, I love the, I love the Gospels. In Mark chapter 2, and, and this is a, a, just a picture around this building, this is a prophetic picture. In Mark chapter 2, there's four guys who bring their friend on a stretcher and they scratch through the roof and they bring the man to Jesus. In the same chapter, there's another man who says to Jesus, would you come with me and meet my friends? That's what the gospel does. I'm not, it's not the same house. First of all, you've got four guys who bring one man to Jesus, and then you have one man who takes Jesus to all his friends. And that's Matthew. He, he, he couldn't come to Jesus by himself because he's a dirty old tax collector, but he took Jesus to all the dirty old tax collectors. You ever wonder where many of his disciples came from? And, and that's just because of the expression of the gospel. So we're moving into a, a, a new sphere and a new generation. And this morning, oh, hallelujah. We're going to not just do some calling out, we're going to do some sending this morning. I've got my lovely daughter, Larissa, here. One of my lovely daughters, Larissa. Larissa is going back to the USA this week. Worked for Equipers Central Coast, and we want to pray for you this morning because you, you were part of this house. Just to give you Larissa's background, she was adopted. No, sorry, no, it's, it's the wrong one. It's the wrong one. Larissa's name means cheerful maiden, and she was the only one of our kids who could ever escape from our house. In fact, once. Once someone came up our drive and said, is this your child? And she was two streets away. She was about 18 months, 19 months old. And we felt like the parents from hell. So when you have trauma, this is where it came from. <laughs> but you, you were part of the Tuako and Pukki Church. And you came, you responded to your parents calling. But now you've got your own calling. And, you know, you're, you're in the city for many years with Pastor Helen. And you were part of establishing East, Cooper's East. Now you're going to bring weight and leadership and fun to California. There's a town in California called Gorman. When Larissa goes there, they're going to go, oh. <laughs> so Larissa, I'd like you to stand because I'm going to ask Pastor Roku to pray for you. And Ollie and Yana and Gordy and leaders. So, so what we're doing this morning, folks, although it's my daughter, I can do this because I have permission. <laughs> but we're sending Larissa out as a missionary from here. And you might think, well, oh, she's here. But you know what? We need to do this because it's a prophetic statement for our future. And just as parents, we just want to say, we're really happy for you. Mum's not, she's scared. Just asking that you don't do 120 miles per hour on the motorway. So just pray. Thank you, Jesus. Just reach out a hand, folks. And we want to thank you, Father, for your anointing upon the rest. Lord, we just, uh, we just pray, Father, that as she takes this next step, that every step that she takes, Lord, will be one so that she can see that there is a path that's lit up before her. Father, that um, there'll be some adventure, there'll be some excitement. Lord, there'll be times, Father, where she will just need to be just totally faithful, Lord, and, and seeking you in everything. Because there'll be some unknowns, and Lord, I just really believe that there'll be times 
and even like your parents have, there will be some times when those little thoughts come in and there will be some, some moments where you just go, man, am I in the wrong place? And I think you need to just remember those times when God has spoken directly to you, where you felt the peace of His presence, and when you just know deep down, actually, Lord, I know that you've got me. That you're in the palm of his hand, and he's protecting you, he's caring for you. And in those moments, you'll feel the peace of God. Just pray that it'll just totally surround you. And Lord, we just look forward with excitement, Father, to see the things that's going to happen in the Central Coast and, and even the rest of the world. Father, as she follows you, Lord, as she, as she uh, stretches out, even Lord, as she feels maybe somewhat vulnerable, their vulnerability will be a, just a place where you can work. And that's another thing, Lord, so when you're vulnerable, when you're desperate, God restores, He heals, He uplifts. And in those moments, you just feel His presence like you've never felt before. And Lord, we thank you always that you've got us. We thank you that you've always got us. Lord, we look forward to catching up, seeing the photos. But um, Lord, just bless you. Bless you, keep you safe. Jesus for this incredible daughter of the house. Lord, I thank you for the privilege that we get to pray her out. Lord, her her her, her, her papa is rooted in the church, uh, as we have heard through Pastor Mike. And um, Larry, I see this beautiful picture actually of um, it's, yes, you're, you've matured and your walk with God, but what is ahead of you in the new season, God? wants to unleash on California the little girl with the joyful heart who sees, you know, you are fun, but there's wisdom and joy in what we carry. And I see this picture, you are actually going to toil the ground, that, well, not toil, but turn the soil, fellow, I think it's called, but, you, but I actually see you um, uh, with sort of red or pink gumboots on, <laughs> uh, and you're just digging up the dirt, uh, and um, and you're a little girl because this is the promise that God has has had over your life since before you were born. You are a change maker. You're one that will go into um, uh, into different settings and stir things up with joy and with heart. And people won't even know, but change is needed there. There is an apathy uh, that has um, kind of settled. And just as we heard today, God's going to use you to, to call people, to call the church into its promise, and that's beyond where they have settled today. So, Father, we, we, we send her with, not on her own, but with the covering of the church, with the covering of the elders. Uh, and so, Father God, we anoint her this morning for this new season. We thank you for what she has invested and deposited here in Aotearoa. Um, with our children um, most of all and we and we pray your provision as she steps out Lord I pray that she gets a room all to herself in this <laughs> when she goes back to California she's been sharing uh, a room with somebody else but Lord we just pray that that landlord releases the room that she can lock the door and we just say open that door in Jesus name Amen Church and um, just the community. 
Um, you're someone that really brings um, people, you're, you're like a magnet. Um, people will find you, and um, even as you just are out in the streets, if, as you're just out in the community, um, outreaching and playing with people more, um, God's really going to use that to just really um, bring people to Him, that, you're, that they're going to see you and see that there's something different, um, and that's something that I, I really enjoy, <laughs> being in your presence, is that you're someone, someone so joyful in my life, um, and you're going to be that for other people. So we thank you, Lord, for those. So we thank you, God, for your protection over her. That um, just in the near future, with any visas or anything, God, that um, there is just your full provision in that space in her life, God. Um, that that this is your plan and everything will work out. And we thank you, Lord, for just the many opportunities that will come from this. Um, and yeah, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Craig, can we just all stand? We're just going to finish right there. I think it's good to finish on a prophetic note and then worship God. But I do need to say, Oli.